one, Judge Carberry was the captain of the 1922 Notre Dame football team under Newt Rockney. He was a big, hard-hitting end at Notre Dame in the halcyon days of George Gipp to the beginning of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But possibly no one had as interesting a journey getting to Notre Dame against the headwinds and achieving greatness as Glenn Carberry. It took him from the fields of Iowa to being wounded on the battlefields of France in the Great War to the gridiron wars at Notre Dame. This is the story of his journey and how his incredible family helped steer the way. Glenn Michael Carberry was born in Panora, Iowa in 1896, one of 13 children of J.H. and Molly Walsh Carberry. Molly and J.H. were Irish Catholics who embraced the American dream. They saw how the sport of football engaged their older sons and interested the younger ones. The oldest child, William, played in the Guthrie County Leagues as the high schools were not fielding teams. Graduating high school in 1904, Molly and J.H. encouraged him to go to the State University of Iowa and applauded his desire to continue with football. He became a star at Iowa as an end punter and punt returner. Four years later, Joseph Leo, the next oldest brother, followed Bill to the University of Iowa, where he was also a star, punter, punt returner, and in. Then it was Glenn, six years behind Joe and 11 years behind Bill. A high school freshman in 1912, Guthrie County Schools still did not have football programs, so Molly and J.H. sent Glenn to live with Sister Gertie and her husband, Paul Taff, in Ames, Iowa. Ames was a bigger town with a vibrant high school sports program. With hard work and great coaching, Glenn became a football star in Ames. And just like his brothers, he played defensive and offensive end. After three years, everyone in Ames thought Glenn would play at the local college, Iowa State, then called the Agriculture and Mechanical College. But Molly and J.H. had been writing letters telling of Glenn's abilities to Iowa's congressman, and their efforts paid off. Iowa's United States Senator Albert Cummins got Glenn an appointment to the West Point Military Academy. And in June of 1916, Glenn left the farm in Panora on the train for New York. It would be a memorable year for West Point football. The varsity team went 9-0, beating arch-rival Notre Dame 30-10. As a plebe, Glenn practiced with the freshmen, and his strong play was noticed. But after seven months of classes in January of 1917, West Point advised Glenn, due to deficiencies in math, he would have to leave the academy, ending his West Point career. Glenn returned to Gertie and Paul Taft's in Ames and enrolled at the Iowa State College. It was a tumultuous time while he was taking classes as war was declared. Glenn's Iowa forefathers had fought in the Civil War and older brother Joseph Leo had just finished Army basic training. Glenn went to nearby Camp Dodge, Iowa and enlisted in the United States Army on September 4, 1917. Camp Dodge mustered in thousands of men from all over the country, and they also had a football team. Glenn joined the 88th Divisional team at Camp Dodge and played games in 1917 versus colleges such as Nebraska and Drake. The Great War intensified in wanting to see action. Glenn volunteered for the 804th Pioneer Regiment at Camp Dodge. This was a colored regiment that needed commissioned officers. They were being sent straight to the war for combat engineer needs. They deployed together, sailing to France in September of 1918. Proud her boys in line Over there, over there Send the word, send the word over there That the Yanks are coming Back at Camp Dodge, three weeks after Glenn left, the deadly Spanish flu hit the base on October 1st, 1918, and 700 of Glenn's fellow soldiers died. Glenn's volunteering may have saved his life. 
Lieutenant Carberry's Company K disabled mines with the Second Army. At one point during ordnance disposal with his battalion, a huge ammo dump exploded, injuring many, including Lieutenant Carberry, who was hospitalized for three weeks with injuries. A permanent injury was a ruptured eardrum, and he was never able to hear again out of his left ear. Glenn sailed to New York with his regiment on the USS Philippine, arriving in New York in August. That same month, the entire Carberry family had moved to Ames to give all the children opportunities like Glenn had had. Glenn, fresh from the war, joined the family, and Molly was excited to give him the news. Her nephew, Glenn's first cousin, Earl Walsh, of nearby Adair, Iowa, was playing in the backfield of Notre Dame, and he had told Coach Rockney about Glenn, and Rockney had heard of Glenn when he was in high school and at West Point, and wanted him to come try out. Glenn appreciated Earl putting the word in for him. Glenn had also heard through his football channels Rockney was interested. He decided he would now try to make maybe the best team in the world. It was said on the train platform the day Glenn left for South Bend, Molly put a rosary in his hand and said, For he knows the plans he has for you, plans to prosper and not be harmed. Glenn squeezed his mother's hand and was gone. And when I explain something to one man that's playing the same position you are, listen and see what it is. So I won't have to waste all that time going and telling the same thing over a dozens and dozens of times. Take it there. Oh, not good. Oh, lay out. Good. Fifty-four, twenty-nine, eighty-seven. Keep one. Two, one, the two, three, three, keep one. Hit that edge, the ball Seven. Football had been Glenn's life, but he realized this was not Guthrie County. He was 24 years old. Rockney had an organized, revolutionary, and complicated offense and defense. Rockney, like Glenn, had also taken a long road to get to Notre Dame. He'd worked four years in a Chicago post office just to make the money to attend Notre Dame. His favorite sport was track, but at Notre Dame, he became famous as a football All-American at Inn. He knew this World War I vet law school student would be going against two of his very best ends and two of the best ends in the game, Eddie Anderson and Roger Kiley. Anderson, another Iowan, had a coach's mind, could catch and block. Kiley had a killer instinct, caught passes one-handed like a baseball and broke free for big gains. Newt knew what Carberry might be thinking. It was a dawning team with tough competition. But he wanted to welcome and integrate him, yet to let him know he had to work. Early in one of the practices, Glenn subbed for Kylie and promptly dropped a pass. Carberry, Rockney yelled. Keep playing like that and you'll spend more time on the bench than any judge in history. Judge became Glenn's nickname from that day on. Judge Carberry earned a coveted spot on the 1920 team, a team that became legendary. Called a back alley brawl by the New York Times, every major news organization was present. Judge played well, but the star was George Gipp, leading the Irish after being behind and winning 27 to 17. Gipp was a straight up tall runner, had finesse, yet wild abandon. To quote the papers, he was spectacular at all times, even when they tried to take his head off, but only got his helmet. Judge was noticed in this battle. The 1920 Notre Dame team ended the season undefeated at 10-0. They were voted retroactively the national champions.
But the season ended in tragedy when Gipp, consensus All-American first team, died of pneumonia. The funeral procession leaving the chapel at Notre Dame included the war veteran Carberry and all Gipp's teammates. The 1920 photo was taken after Gipp died with Rock instructing a place be made. They added George to the photo later. Newt, with a degree in pharmacy, had created a prescription for winning at Notre Dame, and few fans felt anyone would stop them in 1921. Moe Hart at quarterback, Hunk Anderson on the line, Eddie and Roger at end, and a backup of stars like Judge. They took a 22-game winning streak into Iowa City, Iowa. It was the game of the century for Iowans and a milestone for Glenn. He and cousin Earl Walsh plus Anderson were coming back to their home state, Rockney, looking for an edge, thought the Hawkeyes' black jerseys were too close to his navy. This game was the first the Irish wore green. Glenn's family would be in the stands, including the two former Hawkeye star brothers. The rumor was Molly and J.H. said they were cheering for Iowa but praying for Notre Dame. The old Iowa field by the river was filled. The Hawkeyes had quarterback Aubrey Devine from West High School in Des Moines, a fast end around runner who could throw strikes on the move. Also, as all college players were at that time, he played O&D. Another star was the helmetless tackle from the Mississippi River town of Clinton, Iowa, Duke Slater. As a youngster, his dad had told him, I will buy you a helmet or cleats, but not both. Duke took the cleats and never looked back. Glenn, anxious to play, had been injured the game before. Notre Dame got behind early. Rock sent Glenn in, taking a gamble he would bring it for his family in the stands. Knowing he was injured, Iowa sent three straight running plays to his side of the defense, but he fought blocks and stuck every one runner for a loss. The pivotal moment of the game was a key down when Duke Slater took out three Notre Dame players on one block, opening the way for fullback Gordon Locke out of Denison, Iowa. Iowa won 10-7. Duke's block was immortalized in bronze in Iowa City. The Hawkeyes went on to win the mythical national championship of 1921. The Irish went on to win the rest of their games, including Purdue, Nebraska, and Army. Glenn played great football through it all. Glenn led the team with their 8-0-1 record in 1922 into the final game of his collegiate career at the Nebraska Cornhuskers. They had lost to Glenn and Notre Dame the last two meetings. Glenn broke his hand early but played on. At halftime, the Cornhuskers' longtime equipment manager, who was sick and dying at home, was let in on a stretcher at halftime, and from his deathbed, encouraged the Husker lads to beat the Catholics. Nebraska took home a 14-6 win. Notre Dame finished 1922 8-1-1. For Glenn's three years with the Irish, they were 27-2-1. Judge was hampered by injuries much of his Notre Dame career. He led by example, and his gridiron brothers and coaches held him in high regard, especially for his World War I service and for never quitting on his football dreams. Judge went into the new pro game and played end on two different teams and worked as a lawyer simultaneously in Syracuse, New York. He was drawn back into the college game assistant coach at Michigan State. Then meeting up with cousin Earl Walsh again, they coached at Fordham in New York City. Judge coached the linemen, the renowned blocks of granite. One of them was Vince Lombardi future coach of the Green Bay Packers, and legend of the NFL. In 1931, Coach Rockney, catching a flight on a U.S. mail plane, lost his life when it crashed in a field in Kansas. A rosary was found tightly clutched in his hand. Born in Norway, a living legend in the United States, the world mourned. Newt's record at Notre Dame was 105 wins, 12 losses, and 5 ties, equaling a winning percentage of .898, which will probably never be broken. In 1938, Molly died in Ames. All her boys were pallbearers. 
she raised well-rounded, educated, and devout young men and women who made positive differences in their worlds. Glenn married Grace Elizabeth Brennan in 1940, and they had two sons, Michael and William. Glenn retired as a lawyer with the Veterans Administration and died in 1976. Glenn Judge Carberry and the great Carberry family will never be forgotten. Lizzie Carberry, Molly and J.H.'s oldest daughter, married James Aquinas O'Brien, and their grandson Joe played for the Colorado Buffaloes as a tackle and defensive end, and her great-grandson Colin plays as of this writing for the Wyoming Cowboys.